doing some meta programming in Ruby and wanted to deep dive into these two topics. But I do have some comparative language and stuff in here if you're not a Rubyist, that's totally fine. So let's talk about frozen objects first. Um, you may have seen things like this, maybe in other languages. So you have a constant. So in Ruby, you typically put dot freeze on the end of the constant to make it a constant. What does it actually do? So if you try to append an item to the end of this constant array, it's going to raise an error, like you'd expect. If you try to reassign one of the elements of it, it will raise an error. If you ask it if it's, if it's frozen, it will say it is. If you try to reassign it to something else, it'll let you, but it'll print a warning. So a little Ruby board there, but for the most part it works like you would expect. Um, let's go with a more complex example. So when I created this presentation, well, I was especially thinking about cats. Um, I had actually just bought a cat encyclopedia, so I wanted to program about it. So we have a cat class. We can store information about specific cats, and as the cat eats too much, it can increase its weight or decrease it. So we have a constant of our cats, two species, uh, and notice the freeze on the bottom. So we're going to freeze that constant. So what happens when we do various things to this array of cats? So we try to assign to the first element of our constant array. What will it do? Yep, raise an exception. One time error, can't modify frozen array. Cool. Uh, okay, we want to make a fat cat. What will happen? I believe it'll let it. Yeah. It works. But why does that work? How good is that? Right. Because dot freeze only works on the top level object. So it's only on the array, not the children of the array, right? Because these are objects within the array. So it's not a deep freeze. Okay. So how does this all work? Um, so in Ruby, object is the root of the hierarchy, as you'd expect. It defines both a freeze and a frozen method. Um, when an object is frozen, the rule is that you can only assign to instance variables in the actual constructor. So, as it turns out, if you look at the standard library, various classes already come frozen for you, which is kind of nice. So symbols, these are like intern strings in Java, so basically like immutable strings. Um, oh, in the later versions of Ruby, um, you can basically say that string constants are immutable by default. There's like a special comment you can magic comment you can put on the top of your file in preparation for Ruby 3 where they're expecting that to be the default again like both C sharp and Java have had for a long time. Um, regular expressions come frozen by default which is good because they're already complex enough and uh, fix some sort of numbers like you say you know one and it ask if, it, if it's frozen it'll be like yep it is so that's good. Um, so what if you want to freeze your own objects so all we have to do to our cat class in order to make it immutable is to say freeze at the end of the constructor. Um, the return value of a constructor in Ruby is always the object. So you can put whatever you want in the last line. You can say return, I don't know. I think you can say return whatever, it just ignores it. Um, but we can't do this. I mean, we can define the method, but we're going to get a runtime error if we try to actually call that um, method that's going to mutate the state. So we got to get rid of it. Um, why would you want to make an object immutable? Well, the biggest argument is simplicity. Um, and also, immutable objects are thread safe by default. Um, but remember, the entire object graph needs to be immutable for this to be true. So in our example before, right, it wasn't a thread safe array of cats because the cats were mutable. But if we use the frozen cats, then it is. The frozen cats aren't very fun. <laughs> <laughs> they come on a stick. You can whack them on the table. Depending on your perspective on cats. <laughs> Maybe it is. All right. Um, at downside in Ruby, it's a little bit harder to do. You can't really do traditional method memoization. So taking a step back, what is method memoization? It's caching the result of a pure function. So, all right, what's a pure function? A function that its return value is always the same for the same input. 
and its evaluation has no side effects. It doesn't modify a database, it doesn't modify like a printer or like the outside world. Um, so the kind of standard way to do this in Ruby is to like you have a wrapper um, method that does the that does the memoization, then you have like the thing that actually does the calculation, and you store the result in an instance variable. If you actually have input to the to the method, unlike this example, you probably have some sort of hash that would store like, okay, you define a key in that hash that corresponds to the input of the method, and then you just store all the results in that hash as the values or something. But you can't do this with an immutable object because you can't assign to that, that uh, instance variable. All right, comparative languages. Uh, in other languages, in Java, if you're gonna do this, you can declare your fields with a final keyword. C Sharp has read only, and the compiler will enforce if you try to violate that, if you try to assign to those anywhere else but the constructor, it won't compile. And in JavaScript, there are many ways to do this. Here are two. Um, the official like built-in language has object.freeze, where you pass it an object and it sets a frozen bit. You can't modify the data. You can't. You can also not modify like the the metadata about the class or the prototype. So it freezes that as well. And then um, the most well-known library for this in JavaScript is immutable.js, but there's a lot out there. Any other languages people want to bring up before I move on from immutable? I need to look up Python. You need to look up Elixir. Yes, there's a lot. All right. So, um, Ruby callables. So these really form the basis for metaprogramming in Ruby. So I want to talk about what the building blocks are so we can understand them. Um, so there's four basic callable types. There's blocks, procs, lambdas, and methods. So we're going to go over these four and compare and contrast them. So blocks, oh, but before we get into that, let's introduce another animal. We have a mouse. So we have a living bit and a speed, which is just a number. And we can tell if it's living or dead, and we can kill it. Um, so here's an example using blocks and our cat and the mouse. So we've added a method called hunt to the hat class, to the cat class, and um, we can see if it kills a prey. So in this case, um, well, let's look down here real quick. This is the way we expect it to be called, right? So we have like my cat and then hunt and then this Boolean expression, right? That's, that's inside, the, this is the block, right? The do and end here. So if this expression returns true, then the prey is caught. So, um, and it's eaten. Um, so in this case, all we're doing is comparing the, the speeds and if it's faster than the, the prey, then it catches it. Um, the other thing that's going on here is um, Ruby has this notion of yielding control, so um, that's how execution actually changes from this method to the actual block. So if your method is passed a block, then you can yield to it. In this case, we're yielding ourselves to it, which we'll get to in a minute. I find that in Ruby, that notation yield is very misleading because it's it doesn't like in other languages, they physically yield their space to something else. And if you look up how yield is implemented, it's actually a hidden argument that's passed in and it's just called. It's not, it, there's no, it doesn't have the same thing. So I'm, I'm a little disappointed they use that keyword, I guess. Yeah, that. and that is a good point though. It is a hidden argument. Yeah. It's not like you can name that block in this way. Yeah. We'll get to that. Um, Blocks are closures, so uh, it uses variables in the outer scope. So slow mouse and my cat are defined outside the scope of the block, but you can use them in the block, so it closes over those variables. Blocks can optionally take parameters, so we can say we can pass like the cat object and refer to it as cat inside the block instead of my cat, not close over it. Um, this is kind of a weird thing. Blocks return from the enclosing method, not really the block itself. So in this case, when I say return, it will not actually get to this raise because um, it's returned from the hunt method. Um, so a little weird, but that's the way it is. 
Sorry, it's returned from this method, the, the my method that we're in right here. All right, so as a recap, blocks are closures. They're flexible about their parameters. Um, they return, return exits from the calling method, and they are called with yield. Okay, let's talk about procs. So these are defined in the proc class, and they're defined in two ways. You can say proc.new and pass it a block, incidentally. Um, or you can say, like this keyword looking thing called proc that really isn't a keyword, but looks like it. Um, don't worry about that for now. And then, um, so this is how you'd actually work with the proc. So um, the only thing I've really changed in this example is that we actually pass, this is the reference to the proc, and we call callable.call on it as opposed to yield. So that, everything else is the same. Um, and this is how we use it, right? So we. Uh, they're closures just like before, and then say, we'd say proc do instead of just do without the parentheses uh, for the hum with callable method. Um, like blocks, you can take the parameters if you want. If you don't, it's cool with it. So in this case, I did have it take the parameter of the cat. Um, and then just like blocks, return exits not only from this block, but also from the enclosing method. All right, so recap, they are closures, they're flexible about parameters, return exits from the calling method, but the difference between blocks is they're called with a call, and they are regular objects that can be stored in variables. All right, let's get into lambdas. This is Wait, what's the difference between, I'm like, I don't do any of the yeah. <laughs> it, Is this running in like a separate process or something? No, it's not all the same process. Well, what's the difference like, between this and the prior? Um, Basically, the syntax, uh, so. Well, functionally, it's mostly about what your scope is on either side of, of, the, of the execution of the block or the proc. So in this case, we actually pass in, you have a reference to the proc, like callable is the proc right here. And you actually, you have a call method on that variable. In the block example, there was nothing passed into this method, and you called yield as opposed to calling call on the thing you passed in. So there's not a lot of difference between these two. But I think we, I forget which one it is. One of them t drags the scope of they both the do or origin with it, yep. and they they're not exactly the same though, because you can there's an operator that will convert one to the other. Right? There is. Yep. Yep. Um, they they both they're both closures. Um, Think of the first one, the block, is like an implicit proc. That's really the major difference. I guess, like, can you maybe give an example when you'd use one versus another? Um, or like when you prefer? Blocks are more commonly used. But That's because you, they're syntactic sugar. Yeah, 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 basically. Yeah. And you might want to use procs if you're passing in two functions into another function, or you okay. want to name, you know. Yeah. So that's probably the main reason. Be careful, syntactic sugar causes <laughs> cancer of the colon. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about lambdas. Um, so let's kind of just general information. They're defined in the prop class. Yes, I know it's confusing, um, but they're created with a lambda keyword. Um, so they're declared in two different ways. So instead of saying proc.new, we just say lambda. Or we can have a stabby lambda. So instead of saying lambda, we use the arrow looking thing. Um, if you look at the object that this returns and you say, what class are you? It's going to tell you it's a proc. And you're like, what the heck? This is a lambda. So if you ask it if it's a lambda, it'll say true. Um, so this is an example of it working with lambdas, it's actually the same exact code as you saw before in the proc example. How to use it here is no different whatsoever. Um, lambdas are closures. Um, but it's strict about parameters. So remember when we called it, we passed in a reference to ourselves. So it had one parameter, right? So if I try to do, so this is how I call it, right? I have to say like lambda do and then cat is that first parameter. If there were two parameters, I'd say cat comma whatever is the second thing. Um, but if I try to declare it like this, I'm going to get a, uh, an exception because I have the wrong number of arguments, right? I expected there to be one, but I did, I 
I'm expecting zero because I don't have any parameters on the do. Um, this is another big difference. They return only from themselves. So um, it's kind of more intuitive than what most people would expect. Like the return statement just returns out of this, uh, this little lambda as opposed to the enclosing method. All right. They are closures. They're strict about parameters. They return exits only from the lambda. They're called with call. And they're regular objects of the class proc. And they can be stored into vari in variables. All right. Final type. Methods. Um, if you've done any Ruby programming, you've seen this. They're declared with def. And they can, they can be treated as a callable object, which is the sort of more interesting part about it in this context. So um, this is a field, and it defines a hunt method. It takes a hunter and the prey, and it has you know log logic that we've seen before pretty much. And if it if the prey is caught, it increments the number of kills that have happened. Um, okay. So this is where it gets interesting, though. The methods can actually be treated as callables themselves. So if I I can instantiate the class, and there's a method on objects called method, where if you pass it the name of a method, it actually returns you an instance of that method, right? So we basically kind of extracted that hunt method into this variable and its class is method, its arity, so the number of parameters is two, and it responds to call, right? So it's that same interface that we've seen. Um, so if we have that method object, we can actually call it ourselves. So this is the hunt with method example. So we pass it like a method object and it calls call on the method. This is very similar to um, the code before, except I explicitly have to pass in prey because methods are not closures. Um, so if I try to do something like close over um, other variables that are defined in the class, it won't work, right? So if I have like a class variable here called you know, class prey, if I try to use it inside a method, it's gonna throw an exception because it can't do that. It can only use things that are passed into it or its own local variables. Recap, they are not closures, but they are bound to an object. They're strict about their parameters return only exits from the method itself, and they can be extracted with dot method, and they're called with dot call. All right, big picture, when to use what? Blocks, start here, use it for simple cases when only one callable is passed to an object, sort of that implicit behavior. Um, if you look at a lot of like uh, methods in the standard library, a lot of times, the block is optional. So if you want to customize the method with your own logic, then you'll pass a block into it. So like sort in Ruby does a default thing, but if you pass it a block, you can define exactly how the two objects are equal in terms of winning the sort. Right? That's a classic example of it. Procs versus lambdas, they're very similar. Um, the Ruby community tends to prefer lambdas because the return semantics are closer to what developers expect and the parameter checking. Checking is more strict, but um, if you don't need that strict parameter checking or you don't want it, then just use a proc. Um, so yeah, wrapping up, um, it can occasionally be helpful to treat a method as a callable using objects method to extract the method. I've personally never done it, it's just kind of interesting that it's there. But these techniques are really a lot of the basis of metaprogramming in Ruby. And it's how you would create like a domain-specific language within Ruby itself. Um, all right, callables in other languages. Um, so Java and C Sharp both have callable expressions at this point. Uh, back in the day, Java didn't have those. So what you would do if you wanted to pass a function into another function, you essentially have to create what they call an anonymous inner class. You would not. You wouldn't have to declare the actual class, but you could, it was essentially basically passing a class with like one method in it, which would essentially be the function that you're passing into the other thing. Um, but since, I don't remember what version, but newer versions, I think 1.7, 1.6, newer versions have had callable expressions. C-sharp has had it for a while. Um, and then 
this whole discussion is a little silly when you talk about JavaScript because functions are such a first class notion. People just pass functions around all the time. Thank you. And um, I was reading this, I've been reading this uh, Ruby metaprogramming book, which is, is good. I'd recommend it. So that's where I have it up. Yeah. These different types of cobbles. And yeah, you can convert blocks to procs if you need to get a reference. From are those frozen cats? <laughs> They're no, no. <laughs> They're frozen me. I, I'd also recommend that book. It's one of the few I've, I re I've read cover to cover. Yeah. Because usually I don't, I don't do that. But uh, it's fascinating what you can do with that language if you want to experiment. Yeah, it's very malleable. 